Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode four here of the Pioneer Performance Center podcast. Today, we've got a great guest in Joe Erdos from the Bridgeport Sound Tigers. Uh, Joe is an alumni of Sacred Hearts Exercise Science Program and grad program. Uh, he spent time at Quinnipiac under uh, you know, some great coaches and mentors and, and is part of a, a circle of up-and-coming strength coaches that are really making a uh, making their voices heard in the field over these last few years. Um, this was a really fun conversation. I had never had the chance to talk with Joe before uh, this interview, uh, but uh, it goes for about two full hours, and we had actually talked for probably 20 minutes before we started recording. So uh, there's there's a lot of great stuff in here, and hopefully you enjoy it. And as always, um, leave comment, comments, questions, uh, feedback under the video. And if you have any suggestions on further guests, we're, uh, we're booking them now. Uh, so this is episode number five. Um, so without further ado, here is Coach Ur- All right, we are here with Coach uh, Joseph Erdos from the Bridgeport Sound Tigers and also an alumni of uh, Sacred Heart University. So before we uh, get any further into the conversation, I'll let him introduce himself, give some background info on, on where he came from, what led him into the field, and, and how he landed where he is now. Uh, so Coach, you can take it away. How's everyone doing today? Um, th- thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Uh, my background info, I, I graduated Sacred Heart University in 2015. Um, my undergrad was in athletic training. I'm also a certified athletic trainer and I practice as one today. Um, you know, during that time I had, I was competing in, on the university's track and field team um, as a collegiate thrower. And I, uh, strength and conditioning was always a passion of mine. I, I, you know, I've been very fortunate in life to, to one, be less strong. Um, and, and by no means do I take that as an identity of myself, but it, it was one of those moments you don't realize you're strong until there's like a defining moment, which I'm sure we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, and, and, you know, I was able to uh, really use that in my role as an athletic trainer as well and in my sports. Um, so I continued my education at Sacred Heart in 2017 um, through through uh, the graduate program here with the Masters of Exercise Science and uh, Nutrition. And I worked at the university at the time as a graduate assistant for club sports as an AT. And I also completed two internships at the time with Prentice Hockey Performance in Stanford and Quinnipiac University. Um, So upon completion of my master's degree, I saw the need for athletic training and strength and conditioning um, bridge. And a lot of the principles, in my opinion, overlap in terms of rehab and return to performance. So so I wanted to continue a dual role because I felt that it was my, um, it was essentially my my dharma or my duty in life. you know, so I sought out positions as such, and I landed uh, in the New York Islanders organization, where I'm currently working in the, with their minor league team, the Bridgeport Sound Tigers of the American Hockey League, and I'm working as both an athletic trainer, the assistant AT, and the only strength and conditioning coordinator there. So, so that's where I've been for the past three seasons, and uh, yeah, that's, that's a, my background. Yeah, that's great, and there, there's a lot we want to. Uh dive into here I know uh but what what was that seminal moment for you that you mentioned uh, what was that point where you knew well was- yeah yeah so uh you know the the biggest defining moment and I think every moment in our lives are defining in in an aspect you know they kind of shape us they all do but but some way more than others so, so it's funny I'm cleaning out my house as I'm waiting and I'm finding binders from from my eighth grade where I was writing my own basketball training programs and they were literally from uh bodybuilding.com and I had the uh, Triple H bodybuilding guide. So it was three sets of 10 bicep curl, three sets of 10 hammer curl, three sets, you know, just your classic. And I'm like, how did I do this? Um, so I, I got caught in high school from my, you know, uh, my high school's basketball team. And unlike Michael Jordan, I, I didn't make it after that. <laughs> so um, my parents were actually really positive and they're like, you know, you, you're, I'm Slovak myself, not that where you're from matters, but it, um, we have a rich history in my family and country as throwers. So they're like, why don't you try a shot, but your grandpa did it at the university level. So I picked one up through kind of far and I was like, okay, this is, this is cool. I'm going to stick with this. And then in my junior year, it was about the same time that, um, 
juggernaut training systems was starting. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I remember, and I still, I screenshot the message uh, probably last year. I messaged Chad Wesley Smith and like, this is now like 2008. Um, <laughs> so it's like, he's still trying to make the Olympic trials. Yeah. And I was like, Hey, I see your program. I want to get better at throwing. Um, can't, can't, how do I get this? And he's like, buy the program. So I bought it, walked into, we were first fortunate. We had a weight room, walked in. I showed the coach. I was like, here's the program. And he's like, okay. So I remember the first day. Wait, I, so you, your coach was okay with you bringing in someone else's program to do it? wasn't. A... Yeah, because at the time it was, it was all football lifting. And, and mind you, uh, from my freshman to sophomore year, I graduated my freshman year or I finished my freshman year at 180 and came back in the fall at 265. So I was a big boy. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah. And I've never lifted before. So it was all football and, you know, I was cool with the football guys. I, I didn't play, um, because of my, my own personal medical history. But I, um, I walked in and they were like, yeah, you could lift and kind of just do your own thing. These are the open hours. And I was like, oh, well, uh, what do you think of this program? I don't, I don't know anything about it. This guy just throws really far and just totaled an elite power lifting. And they're like, yeah, sure, looks good. So the first day I remember I lifted, I front squatted 275 for three. RDL the first, three, the first time you ever got under a bar? First time ever. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Did 30 strict glute ham raises and rdl 315 and then i couldn't walk for two weeks um, <laughs> sounds, sounds about right but i remember it was like you know my buddies on the football team who were very strong were you know i just jumped in with them we had like three out of rack and we just kept adding weight and adding weight and adding weight and then we hit like 275 and i just hit it for a triple and like it's just like that silent i'm like what's up and like, I remember it was one of those things, like everyone was just like murmuring in school, like, oh my God, did you hear? And I, I have no idea, like anything or care. Um, so that was the moment where I was like, wow, things are a little different. And, <laughs> you know, in track and field, you know, and, I, and mind you, as I continue to, to progress, a, track and field is an unbelievable sport because you can see results in the numbers. You know, it's not a team sport where it's a score. So, I mean, that year I probably added eight feet to my shot put distance, which was considerable. Yeah. Um, so at this point I'm hooked and, uh, it kind of all just took off from there. And, and, you know, I've been blessed to have people in my life that led me along the way and supported me. Um, and some of it's a little bit luck. Like I'll never forget, like two of the first books I bought for training was, um, Ripito five by five and super training, both, which like looking back, I was like, man, super training was one of the first books I ever bought. Like what like <laughs> how is that even possible yeah I was right? like 16 years old but i literally <laughs> went on like elite fts forums which i don't even know if they're active these days um but back in the day i'm sure you know they were that was it yeah that was the only resource and i was like what's the best training book and they're like super training i'm like okay this is 70 dollars. i'm gonna ask for this for christmas i hope it's good and mm -hmm. uh, yeah that's funny well first of all um you and I had very different experiences of our first time in the weight room in high school. <laughs> I, I distinctly remember uh, we were doing percentage based training and, and with the bench press, you know, the first sets were whatever, 70% or 65% of, mm -hmm. of our one rep max. And I remember being relieved uh, because my first set I got, you know, was actually the empty bar. It wasn't less than the bar. Uh, I had a, another point guard on the team. His was actually less than the bar. And I, I felt happy that I wasn't the lowest on the totem pole, but, um, uh, yeah, so there's a lot to unpack there. So obviously very strong from the get go. So, so you were yeah. drawn to it as just, you know, something that you were naturally good at and you felt like this is something I, I could pursue now at this point. Yeah. But then at this, you know, at the same point, um, I, I come from a medical family background. So my dad's a doctor, my mom's a nurse and, you know, I got really good grades in undergraduate school or at high school rather, um, not to brag by any means, but, but I was a top student and they were like, you should really consider like pursuing a medical degree. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I loved it. And I, I was very fortunate if, you know, I'll probably send this to him after I've never thanked him personally. And I regret it. My high school athletic trainer, Dan McDonough, um, he, my senior year, offered an athletic training course as an elective, which was unbelievable. We actually got to shadow for two hours and I took it and I was obsessed with it. Mm. And I remember I, I probably had like a 99 or hundred average. That's how obsessed I was wow. with it. Um, and I was like, you know, this is really cool because if I do want to pursue being, you know, an orthopedic surgeon or even a physiatrist or whatnot, 
I still will be able to learn the body, learn sport, be around a sports setting and kind of blend everything I want. And then and that's one of the, the main um, appeals of the job as an AT to me is that it's very fluid in the sense that, you know, we wear, we wear many hats, everyone will say that. Um, so, so I knew when I went to college that I wanted to, to continue to compete in athletics. And I knew I wanted to specialize in orthopedics. And I knew that I also wanted to learn performance. And I thought this kind of offers everything for me. Um, so let's pursue it. And if I didn't like it, then so be it. But I knew I would like it um, yeah. based on this class. So I'm very fortunate for that opportunity because looking back, I was like, wow, getting that experience in high school was huge. Um, yeah. Because I don't think a lot of high schools are able to have something like that. No, and I, you know, maybe more so now um, than than back when you know you were in school, or certainly when I was in school. I remember I was lucky just to take a, you know, I think a half a semester class that was focused on some basic anatomy. Uh, right, right. It, it was, it was really. I didn't, and this is how bad it was. We were talking before we started recording how I was, I was fortunate enough to um, have Lee Taft as a high school football coach. And he was, he was starting to become a name in the industry at that point, but, and then he was training me. He had one of the first training businesses probably in the country in 1992 or 93 when I was in fifth grade. And that's mm -hmm. when I had first met him. I wasn't even smart enough to ask him like what educational opportunities existed in the field. Right. Right. I was like, oh, he just figured all this out on his own. He didn't. <laughs> like, I know which, which, which is like, looking back, we think it's ridiculous, but like, there were, I mean, how many coaches is just, they were the strongest person in town back in the day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so now like, uh, you know, without giving, uh, you know, any specifics away, but just your, your job responsibilities where you are. So you, I know yeah. there's a lot of overlap between the two, but you know, how, how much of the day are you, do you have your ATC hat on versus your yeah, strength there, coach? There's a ton. So, 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 you know, Professional sports is its own beast um, in the sense that, you know, there's a lot more commitment in terms of, you know, helping with gear, helping load things in and out, um, you know, really interpersonalize with, with the the inner room, meaning players, staff, et cetera, it's just because it's one focus of control. Mm -hmm. So so I really get to know these people and it's a family at this point, but, but it really depends on the day. You know, and, and the way I bucket it is there's, there's a traditional practice day, which is what you would assume it's it's practice and then we usually have an off ice session that i'm in charge of and then a game day it's um a game day so so there will be like a morning skater practice and and if if that happens that day and then the game so to to give a traditional number it really depends on the day um most days it's 50 50 and on a game day it's a little more athletic training just because there's less train off ice training uh, that doesn't mean it doesn't happen with non-dress players but yeah, it's yeah. uh it's just what the need is. Um, right. So, and, and, and how many ATCs are there on staff or is there it just two. you? There, there's a, no, no, I, I'm the assistant. So, okay. so I don't, I don't deal with administration or whatnot. So, okay. but, but I help when I can, and I, I do a lot of the manual work and a lot of the return to play and a lot of the um, taping, bracing, et cetera. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. And, and that's, that balance has worked out well for you. Is it? Yeah, it's been, it's been awesome. Be? Yeah, it's 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 been unbelievable. That's great. Yeah, uh, and you know, just your experiences at, at Sacred Heart, like how you know, can you talk about the program a little bit here and how that prepared yeah. you for? Absolutely. You so, so so you know, looking back, so I have the athletic training and, and both the EX program. Um, but I know this is the EX podcast so, or, or talk rather. So I'll talk mostly about EX. Oh, but, hopefully but... <laughs> eventually someone that's not in the EX department will listen to it. So yeah. you can, you can address both. <laughs> That'll be great. I'll be sure. Hopefully I, I bridged the gap, um, <laughs> but, but, uh, but both really shaped me, you know, both pushed me. They gave me unbelievable um, opportunity and settings. You know, I had my own personal um, precautions, as a high schooler going to a school, I'm from Connecticut as well. So I was like, you know, should I go to local school? I never regret the decision I made. I, I, I'm a thousand percent confident it brought me to where I am today. And I even think more so going back for graduate school. So, so in terms of the EX program, you know, I, so let, let me ask you a question actually, do you, cause I understand that there might've been a little change in the title of the program. Um, in, but is there still, the is there still a, Yes. The when graduate I was there, program? Yes. 
Uh, so what was it when you were here? It was performance and nutrition. And now I think it's yeah, sports, so there's, science. Yeah, so we're actually, um, and I don't know what exactly they, they landed on. Um, there was a, I think when I got here, it was just a performance and a clinical track. And yes. I, I don't work uh, too much. I help out a little bit in some some cases with grad students, but I haven't been mm -hmm. too involved with the grad program. Okay. Uh, but we, we just had a meeting a couple of months ago trying to plan like moving forward, what, what right. it's going to look like if we're going to okay. add anything nutrition based or not. But Okay. So, so still performance in clinical sport. I believe so. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was working as an undergrad AT and, you know, in the performance route, I took the performance route. Um, you had the opportunity to do a thesis, which is doing your own research or do a clinical route or do an internship route. Mm -hmm. um, so I did a thesis, but because of that, you know, I wasn't required to do internships, but I still sought them out and was still able to do stuff through connections through the university, not to take anyone's opportunity away. This was extracurricular. And the reason I really did that and I'm grateful for um, because I was working with our club hockey team at the university and I was like, you know, I have the theory of strength and conditioning based on, you know, 2011 super training and elite FTS forums. <laughs> and I have 10 years of my own lifting, but I've never actually coached and I see a need for it with my, my population I'm serving. So, so I, you know, was able to get some great, um, internship opportunities through the university and, and that really shaped my, my, uh, career. I firmly believe that, but in terms of the school, I mean, it's funny, I, I talk with my buddies and I actually, who went there and I also emailed Dr. Moran, I will never forget. You'll appreciate this story in grad school. I was, I was 290 and I was still a competitive strength athlete and, uh, we had a running class, which was a great class by Dr. Moran. And, and first off, like, I, I hope he watches this. And if he doesn't, I'll tell him that I gave him a shout out. But I'll, his I'll Excel, send him this clip. For yeah, sure. yeah, please do. His Excel sheets are unbelievable, um, <laughs> <laughs> which I took for granted at the time until I had to start making my own. I'm like, man, oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I don't want to interject on the story too much. But yeah, he'll, he'll appreciate that. Because when I got here, I had been in the field for, for 12 years and didn't do much with Excel. Right. Other right. Than and then you see his, his, his pie charts and yeah, that he's like think, literally writing uh, the New York I, marathon training. I think I could database. hear I could hear his eyes roll over email when I would send him questions or show him spreadsheets like what yeah. what is this kid doing? Yeah. Why did we yeah, hire so, this guy? <laughs> so I didn't appreciate it then and now I really do, but I'll never forget on the first day of class he was like, everyone will be a runner after this class, I guarantee. And he, he was like, <laughs> Joe and someone else who's also my friend who's a power lifter, he's like, You'll want to run after this class. And I remember <laughs> thinking, like, yeah, okay. And then uh here we are 90 pounds lighter and I've ran a half marathon on my own essentially and i remember emailing him like well i never appreciated it back then but you were right and believe it or not i whipped out my running methods uh research book and wrote my own program and it worked that's um, outstanding yeah so so you know there's something about looking this is why notes are important and i don't appreciate it then but looking back at what you learned you're like oh i did learn that i just didn't appreciate that mm -hmm. um so there's hidden gems everywhere um um you know so, you know, it comes down to what, this is why an external audit, in my opinion, is so important because you think you know what you need, but then someone tells you what you really need. And uh, it's a big disparity at times. Yeah. it's. I mean, it's really hard to see from the inside, right? What's, yeah, uh... right. Because I'm like, I just need to know strength and conditioning. And then, you know, I took a program design class and I was writing like, really good programs at the time, especially compared to my peers in the group projects, which no disrespect to them. It was just different experiences. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, this is easy. And then like running methods class, I'm like, I don't even get this. And then it's like, oh, wow, I actually need to know this or my nutrition, you know, I can't even tell you how, how in, with uh, Bo Greer's nutrition classes, how, how that information comes up constantly yeah. and how relevant that was. Um, so it's been great. I, I can't think that there's one thing that one class that I haven't learned from that I don't use. And, and it, it's a wide, it's a really wide um, topics, you know, it goes from clinical, you know, the only thing I haven't done is run a metabolic cart. Um, yeah. But that's, I mean, I don't think everyone does that um, on my own rather. I've done it with an assistance. Um, but, you know, whether it be nutrition, running, um, 
the anatomy, like it, it, it's, it's very comprehensive and it, it really has shaped my, my trajectory. And is that where, is that where you were connected to, you said you did an internship, I think with Prentice. I did. And that was, through, yeah. uh, that was one of the ones you got when you were at Sacred Heart or was that? Yeah, afterwards? it was, it was a mutual connection. No, it was at Sacred Heart. It was in the summer. Um, so Professor Seebeck had worked mm -hmm. there and he, he suggested I reach out for them and, you know, I had to go through the interview process and all that. And, yeah. And if, yeah. if you're going to end up in the hockey world, that's, that's a great place to start, right? How was Yeah. That and you know, we talk about, we talk about like Lee Taft. Um, mm -hmm. And at the time, like, again, I was just like, I'm working with club hockey and I want to learn hockey strength and conditioning. I was very raw um, mm -hmm. and I'm very appreciative of that opportunity. And it's funny um, because the community is small, but you know, I was working with players and I won't name them based on their privacy, but they were coming off of like a Stanley cup championship or they were coming off of a, uh, Hall of Fame career, and I have no idea who this person is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, that's probably and, a good place to be as a coach, right? Because yeah, you, you're, yeah. you're not, you're not, uh, you're right. not in I'm awe not biased. of these people yeah, walking right, the door, right? right. right? And, it, and it's funny because like we had very good athletes, and it, um, I don't want to say I wasn't impressed, but it was like you know, I would see someone bench 315 pounds, and I was like cool. My buddy just did 550. Last <laughs> like, let's go, let's load it up. Yeah. And it was like me being really young and me not understanding yeah. the ramifications of it all. But it was, uh, yeah. it was pretty surreal looking back. I was like, man, that was a really, that that's thing. happened a couple of times to me even recently, but, uh, you know, we had worked, wow. uh, when I had worked in New Jersey, I got a call from my director and he said, do you know who's coming in for an assessment with you today? I said, yeah, you know, it's, it's so-and-so it's like, yeah, but do you know who he is? I'm like, no, it's like he right. he won the worlds in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu like a year ago. I was like, oh, I don't know. He right, called yeah. for an assessment. I said, <laughs> like I'm not I'm not in that world. Right, um, right. Which is a yeah. And, and and honestly, you know, we could talk about this a little if you want because I I just had this conversation with a colleague the other day where where I think it's really and this goes to to external audits and and I totally stole this from my friend. So, Artie, if you're watching this, I stole this from you. Um, <laughs> But he said it's it's been a game changer for him. Where having an unbiased view of what you need is an, an opinion. But I think that goes as a coaching standpoint. So you know, um, people, I don't think coaches, clinicians, athletic trainers should be biased based on you know my experience is this. I can only work in this sport or this field mm -hmm. because you can bring a skill set that they might need or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, grappling sports is, in my opinion, probably the coolest sports from a from a physiological and from a biomechanical yeah. standpoint yeah. um but they could bring a lot to you as a coach and you could probably bring a lot to them with a more traditional speed background i'm sure mm -hmm. um so it's uh you know and, and i give St stephanie watson who's the head athletic trainer for club sports at athletic uh at sacred heart i give her the most credit because and she'll laugh when she sees this I remember she said I was going to have club club hockey and I was dreading it <laughs> uh, not to talk about it about the university's club hockey team because I love them and they were an unbelievable experience but what you can imagine a club hockey team could be like at times it could be um <laughs> you know at, at stereotypes shouldn't what do you exist, mean as far but... as like they're really strict with getting good quality sleep and eating well and good nutrition exactly and yeah and <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll say that right yeah. exactly um but it was and I was like, oh, you know, do I really have to, like, is there any other option? She's like, no, trust me, <laughs> you're going to be a great fit. And looking back, I remember I called her when I got the job and she's like, and to think two years ago, you were dreading working hockey. <laughs> um, and it, it just comes like, you know, take opportunities and be with an open mind. And I will say that 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 the graduate program is as, as well as all the supporting staff, meaning people in athletics, people in, in um, student union was a huge shape of my life. Um, they really, they really allowed that opportunity to exist. And it's twofold. There's, you know, there's a duality of everything. It's the opportunities there, but it's also what you make of the opportunity. Yeah, so. that's a really good point. And so, I, you know, I talk with a lot of the students and we, ha we have some that are really hungry to get experience and sometimes might not feel like they're getting enough at times, but uh, you know, I try to try to get that point across, like, just because it's not exactly what you think you want or need right now, doesn't mean it's not going to be useful down the road. And you just got to yeah. take advantage of every opportunity you can get. Yeah. And I, and I think that's an unbelievable point. And I remember before, before I landed in pro sports, I, uh, you know, I was, I interviewed for a collegiate job and it was division three. And I remember a 
a sport coach of a sport that I had never worked with asked me like how I would handle working with that. I was like, at the end of the day, it, it comes down to the human that you work with and you can learn something. I'm like, within a summer, I've worked with a club hockey goalie at Sacred Heart to a professional goalie at a private sector gym. And I'm like, how I'm treating the person is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the humility of that as a clinician in our field is so important because I really do see it. And I hear it from young, young aspiring coaches or even older coaches that are like, my dream is to work this. I'm like, no, it's not like yeah. you think it is, but it's not, it's really not glorious. It's, yeah. it's all <laughs> so, so, and you're, you're in that, in that sector. When I, when I ask exercise science students at what, you know, that are freshmen, you know, why did you get into the field? What do you want to do? Most of them are going to say they want to work in professional sports. So as someone who's there now and can, and can look back with perspective and say, you know, it's not exactly what you think it is. Um, you know, what would you say to that freshman that, that comes in saying that's, that's what they want to do? Well, my question is, I would ask them why, and I would ask them, do you know why? Um, and a lot of, cause, cause I've dealt with this question and a lot of them don't have the answer. And then they think about it and it, it's not even freshman students. Cause I, I've had it with 30 year olds. I've had it with 40 year olds. Then they answer it. And then I say, okay, so what's limiting your, you getting there right now? And they reflect a little bit more. I mean, this is very like traditional rhetoric. Um, <laughs> and it sounds a little like motivational interviewing. So exactly yeah. that's exactly what it is that that is a skill set that i actually learned during um march on so since covid um and it's been a game changer for me mm -hmm. and and i'm like so what's limiting you and and then they say well this 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 and i'm like okay so then maybe you need that and then they're like yeah i do and then i'm like okay so then what do you need me for <laughs> yeah yeah and then i always give the example i'll never forget my first year this is like a side story um we had landed in Toronto at 4 a.m. and I was unloading gear and it was minus 20 degrees. And I'm like, <laughs> those moments exist. There's the duality of everything. Yeah. I'm just going to turn a light on. Oh, that's really bright. Uh, nah. I feel like I'm in an interview now. I'm getting yeah. interrogated. <laughs> <laughs> um, this lighting will be fine. Um, so, yeah. So, so you know, it, it's a lot of them don't know why. And, and, you know, there, there was a question you sent in the pre-questions that I, that I would love to touch upon a little bit where someone brought up the salary um, as a, of an AT. And, you know, I, I think that's a question that, like, that's a tough question because I, I, I respect it and I get, and I've been fortunate to not have to deal with um, financial struggles not based on my job, but rather based on, you know, scholarships or GA positions and whatnot, you know, and I've also made sacrifices with that being said. So, so I, I understand my own privilege and I get that it's situational, but I think with anything where it's like, what's, what's your goal? If your goal is to make money, like if my goal was to be a millionaire, I would not be an athletic trainer, right? You know, my right. goal is to serve and be happy, but that's with any job, you right. know, if, like, you know, so, so I think but that's not to say that, that people who, I mean, I know strength coaches that have a million dollar salary at this point. Mm -hmm. It exists. It's shockingly, mm -hmm. you know, I never thought we would see the day, but here we are. Yeah. Uh, so and that's, it's, it's funny. That's something that I've become really interested in in the last uh, few years, especially I was interested in it before, but started taking action on it, uh, you know, more recently. And I'm, I'm kind of older in the game relative to probably mm -hmm. you and, and a lot of coaches, uh, but just like the personal finance side of things in the strength yeah. and conditioning industry and um, finding that balance of like, yes, you want to help people and, and serve people. Um, but also like you want to put food on the table for yourself, for your right. family and, and set yourself up. So you don't have to work until you're, you know, right. You can dig in your own grave. Right. Uh, so like, yeah, I don't, and I don't know if that's not really a question, but just, I think it's, oh, it's, I think it's a great talking topic point. for, uh, I, yeah, I absolutely think so. And that, that's something that I've, I've started to, um, probably within the last year and a half appreciate more um, because that's the reality of not this field, any field, mm -hmm. any, any calling where it's like, right. You know, you have to learn how to do stuff as such. And um, you know, this kind of goes, I'm sure, you know, you might have a different opinion or lens, but I mean, I have recommendations, some books I've read from my CPA friends and it's like the Dave Ramsey method. I, yeah. I don't know, but I mean, it's like the simplest thing and it's like, right. Yeah. It's much like, you know, adding weight to your squat max. Mm -hmm. It's like 
small consistent steps like that's Progress- really the progressive like, overload you know, <laughs> exactly you know what exactly. really uh really uh stood out to me and and i think the first book i read that I, I was recommended two books by a client at the time this was probably uh 2013 or so and one was little book of common sense investing which okay. for, for a math nerd was was good for me um, but then the millionaire next door, which is one yeah, that, yeah, that Dave that's, Ramsey that's, recommends, right? Yep, that I, that was the first one I read too. And the the one thing that stood out there was they talked about people that had one two million dollar annual salaries and their expenses were they were they were losing money every seven hundred thousand, right? And then and then you had people making forty thousand that were retiring with several million in the bank, and it's like wait, and then you start looking at the math, and it's like oh no, you get to choose how you live, right. and and what you value and and your personal financial situation is going to reflect that if you want to you know spend yeah. on things that don't matter right i know i know and, it, and it's 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 such a great point um and now the the one specific i'll never get over is like the millionaires that they talk about and their cars that they buy and how they're like twenty eight thousand dollar value pre-owned cars and i'm like this is hilarious to me because yeah. like I mean, how many strength and... how many strength coaches want an Alico bar like I want one myself I'm not gonna drop that much money on it yeah <laughs> it's like guess what like the difference that makes like you probably don't need and by the time you need it like it won't make a difference so yeah, yeah. know your know your worth yeah and Dave work. talks about yeah. that too I've actually and I'm not a huge follower of Dave Ramsey's but I've no, seen a my, lot of myself his either lately. but it's like the only thing I know you know what I mean yeah I don't my locus of control is just like so little with that world that I'm like, okay, I trust this. It sounds great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he talks about like, you know, get to the point where when, when you buy something and it doesn't hurt at all, then, then you're fine getting it. But if right. you're like, okay, if I buy this now and you have to figure out how you're going to pay your bills for the next three months or six months or a year, like it's probably not a good, good sign. And you're going to start right. down a tough path. And I've, I've been down that path the wrong, in the wrong sense and, and fortunate to be yeah. able to to dig out no, of it, I get but... it. I mean, I, I think it's, I think we all get there at some point. Um, so that's like, and, and in, in talking with students, you know, again, with the freshmen that say they want to go down the ATC route, I kind of ask those same questions. Like what's, what's their why? Uh, and understand, make them sure they understand like what th- those early mornings and late nights, you're not, you're never going to have a nine to five schedule, right. uh, you know, where you go to the office and, <laughs> and sit and do your work. Right. And right. It's, or, it's or get like pay time off or, I mean, I was talking about this with another colleague who's who's a strength coach at a university and he was uh we were just talking about like you know the traditional nine to five job where we're like if we don't show up one day like there's no one that could step in yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know yeah, which yeah. like has its pro every every action has trade-offs so mm-hmm. it's like you know but then we have a traditional off season so yeah they don't so it's yeah. all it's all relative but it's uh I've spent, uh, you know, about three years in a collegiate setting at RPI and okay, yeah, and yeah. good hockey there, yeah. but, um, you know, I didn't, I wasn't in charge of the hockey team, but would help out. But yeah, you'd get during the season, it would be, you're, you're in by 5.00 AM. You're probably right. training till 10 or 11, maybe 12. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you start over again at three or four, as, you know, yeah. especially as an Olympic strength coach where you're working with track teams, yeah. swimming and diving, like teams with 50 to 100 athletes and you're splitting right. them up into groups and like it's uh i mean yeah, your, your head is spinning at the end of the day but that's where you learn yeah. i think and, and grow as a coach also like you absolutely gotta be able to absolutely apply. yeah and and i think i think like you know this is going to be my lame catch-all answer that i will continue to use the rest of my career um but i'll never forget that someone asked me like what was the biggest thing i learned in 2017 from grad school and it's the same thing that i learned now it's the difference between theory and application and you know we're constantly learning that and if you're not constantly reflecting on that you're missing but it's like right those hours on the floor where you're coaching 10 hours a day with 500 athletes like that's not uncommon yeah you're you find really fast what works and what doesn't yep (laughs) Yeah, that's, you know, that's... I'll never forget, like, at a private place in the summer, I had international athletes who didn't speak English. And it's like, my cueing had to get really good. It's, and funny, I had to it's learn. funny you mentioned that. That's uh, the story Lee used to always tell. So he came up through, like, Boletari's Tennis Academy, which I think is yeah, now, yeah. is now IMG, maybe. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, it is. And that's what he, you know, he'd have 175, 100 international tennis players and, and have to get through to them. 
And, right. it's, you, and it's, and coaching is one of those things. Like if something's not working and you've got a large group in front of you, it's, it's, I, I, I like listening to a lot of podcasts with comedians and the stories they yeah. tell about like yeah. bombing on stage. Like I, I, I feel like the, the feelings got to be the same. Like <laughs> if you ever coached a session, that's just not going well. Um, yeah. It's, it's hard to get them back and, and real. It's really and, hard. And, it's really hard. And, 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 you know, I think that's where I always took that for granted because of my AT background where I feel like, and I, I've never actually really thought of this or expressed this until right now, but I feel like AT is constantly picking up or doing the dirty work in life. You know, you're always dealing with people who are hurt. You're always looking for quick patches to get them back out as fast as possible. You're always, and you know, not saying that we don't play the long game either. We absolutely do as a profession, but, but it's like, yeah, you gotta, you gotta, I mean, I'll never forget as an AT, I was on a sideline and I, my first game I had to hold C-spine for someone oh. and it's like, yeah, it's, it's getting thrown right into the fire, thrown right into the fire. Right. And it's like, you really have to figure it out and you do. And it's, it's scary at the moment, but it's, you have no other option. And, and, and that's where, you know, the expertise comes in. And that's where something too, where I'll tell students or tell other prospective people where, you know, they might be looking for, um, I used to really, and this was like me being a young naive coach in like 2015 or clinician. Like I thought that ex experience didn't really matter. You know, like I thought that like, okay, someone who's two years experience versus 10 years, there's, there's not a difference. There's absolutely a difference because you need the reps and you need from, even just from like a cortical standpoint, if we want to get deep into it physiologically, yeah. you, you really subconsciously seed out what matters and what doesn't. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's I remember. Uh, actually, this was my ex first exposure to Sacred Heart was when, when my sister was here as a mm -hmm. student. She was in PT school and, and they hosted a seminar by Shirley Sarman. I don't okay. know if uh, if you've read any of her stuff or. No, I haven't. So the, the strength and conditioning community went through like a, a seems like a short lived but really intense Shirley Sarman phase. OK. Uh, and she wrote a couple of texts, one being I don't know if I have it up here now or where it is a diagnosis and treatment of movement impairment syndromes. Okay. And it, that was kind of born out of the Prague school. And then like the functional movement systems kind of came, came from Shirley Sarman originally mm -hmm. that, that, that framework. And she was, I don't know how old at the time, maybe 82, this 82 year old, like woman given the seminar two days, probably 13 or 14 hours total and was wow. sharp, sharp as a tack and really funny. Um, but she made a good point, like in just uh, in in an expert's world, like how it's about the, the quick recognition of an algorithm. Like right. she she would pull someone out of the, uh, you know, the crowd and do whatever uh, assessment on them. And, you know, I was just out of exercise science grad school and they after i after a few of us strength coaches registered they stopped letting strength coaches register for the seminar because they only wanted physical therapists but she would do her assessments and and like get someone from a seven or eight out of ten pain to like a two and just a couple of basic suggestions and she's like you know yeah expertise is like the, the quicker recognition of, of these patterns and being able yeah. to apply it's not you know you can't go to the book every time and try to find your answer. Like, you know, no. you just learn and see these patterns over and over and over again, thousands of times. And yeah. Yeah. Which I think is an unbelievable point. And it's, it's something that, that, uh, you know, there's a humility to accepting that and there's a humility to, to understand where you are and that, you know, um, and, and something I, I would like to build off of that. And I think it probably matches perfectly where, where a lot of people have asked me, I hate, I hate saying that. Like no one's really asked me. Oh, I, I see all these videos. People are like, people, people a lot are of people saying. have been asking. Yeah, no, no, no one really has. Um, but, but when I self reflect and it's um, like looking at like the game changers, which I'll use in air quotes um, of what's changed in my own practice, it's an appreciation of systems and models. Hmm. Um, and for that, and, 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 you know, if you have an efficient model system, et cetera, the decisions essentially write themselves. And, and this could be through through diagnosing injuries, from looking at deficiencies to exercise selection. Um, you know, I I get it 
where it's just like, yeah, it's obvious I would program a SLDL on this day because we haven't done a single leg posterior chain movement. Um, and, you know, some of my colleagues, et cetera, who, who have ever asked me for advice, I would be like, well, what's your intention of doing something like that? Um, so, so I think it's like this, this blend of, you know, subconsciously exposure or exposure through repetitions, um, through experience and actually appreciating intention and models. Yeah. Um, so. that's and there's so many, you know, that's, that's, that's a really good point. And there's so many now, um, there's so you know, many. How do you, and how, what's your, what's your approach to trying to filter? And this might lead into some of the stuff we were talking about before, uh, before we started recording, but you know, what's your advice? And I, I did ask just, Justin the same question also a few weeks awesome. ago. Um, you know, what's your advice for a young coach who now with the internet and social media, which didn't exist when I, at, to this extent, when I was in grad yeah, school, right? No, no, it's, uh, it's the so wild west right it's, now. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's so easy to get bombarded with so many different systems and people that, that claim to have like the answer. Um, what would be your, your advice and in, in approaching yeah. like trying to digest all the stuff flying at them. Right. Yeah. No, no. And I think, I think you bring an interesting point and I, I don't really know if there's a great answer in the sense, because I think, you know, we're at a time period. It's like, I'm going to go a little philosophical here. It's known as a singularity. Like it's uncontrollable right now in the mm -hmm. terms that like we've now hit a mark where the internet's just going to keep going mm -hmm. regardless. Like we can't control it. Um, so we just have to accept it and, and live with it, you know, um, and, and, you know, with that being said, uh, uh, people, I haven't watched the social dilemma, um, so I can't speak on it, but I get it. And with that being said, there's a duality of everything. So I'm like, just as much as social media can be harmful, it's also unbelievable because like without social media and the internet, like you and I would not be having this conversation yeah. right now. So, yeah. so it comes down to what's your intent and what you make out of it and what you do with it. Um, nothing, in my opinion, is really inherently good or bad. But with that being said, I feel the same about models. So, so you know, we have to look at uh, heuristics or de determining factors in a sense. Um, so I think that there's, gen like this is just shooting off the top of my head. Um, so, so I might have to refine this eventually, um, but it's a great point and a great exercise, thought exercise. But I think that there has to be a couple of constructs that we have to appreciate. The first probably being like, is this based in science? And I think that right there probably knocks out about like 50, probably 50 to 75%. Or is this relevant science? You know, like I love seeing the infographics on, you know, weight loss and why diets work and it's like caloric restriction caloric restriction caloric restriction it's like right that's how it works yeah yeah um so it's like and then the second thing and this is like right from the 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 scientific method you know as like probably uncool or like not sexy as the scientific method may seem it actually works and it's simple <laughs> um so it's like the last step is like does this logically make sense <laughs> And people don't appreciate that. And yeah. I'm just like, does this logically make sense to you? Like, yeah, sure, you can do this. Um, but does this logically make sense? So I think those two alone, like probably see that a lot of it. My third thing is it's like, I like simple, but yet vague things because they're freeing in this sense. Like you're not pigeonholed to one thing, um, if that makes sense to you. So, so you give me an example, like what would the... Um, Like if I, if I was to make my own training program and I said that a one had to be a lower body dominant movement, like that's probably all I leave it at because yeah. at the end of the day, it probably doesn't matter if it's going to be a front squat or back squat. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Because, because as you become specific and it becomes rigid, it also becomes limiting, which also yeah. has its, its pros and cons, Yeah. you know, and I'm not saying there's not a difference between the movements there is, but I'll give you an example of my own world. What happens when you have someone only trap bars deadlifts and they get a slash on the wrist and it's not broken, but they can't squeeze their hand. Right. Now your program's gone. Yeah. <laughs> now that's the on the floor coaching decision that really matters. So I think broader, broad to specific rather than specific to broad. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think, I, I think the last part is like, really trust your gut and your instincts and your guns and like, whatever you have, just run with it. Because, yeah. because I will tell you that like, you know, we could talk about movement assessment models. There's a ton of them and I, I know them all, 
and they're all good mm -hmm. and they all do what they're and and then the, the other thing is like does the model actually do what it's supposed to do yeah <laughs> you know so like i took an rpr class way back in 2016 and i'm like do i get the intended results that are desired yes every time so then like yeah this is an efficient model yeah, yeah. is it the best model i don't know but i th guess the results I think, I want. yeah i didn't th i think that gets lost in in a lot of uh you know, with a lot of people and that just yeah. trusting, trusting yourself and what, you know, what you see to a point, um, you know, the flip side to that, we just did actually, uh, 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 some research in the lab and I didn't, I wasn't part of the actual research, but they used myself and, and someone from the physical therapy therapy department. And we watched a bunch of videos of overhead squats and we mm -hmm. just were trying to quantify, uh, right. what's a two what's a three no a we one? we were oh. actually just trying to identify lateral shift okay direction and magnitude right which is so probably seems simple but it's really hard because i mean we were like, what is lateral shift I don't we know. were terrible <laughs> yeah. terrible like the, it was and it's like i i knew it was going to be like that because i had questions going in that they didn't answer for me and didn't really i don't think it thought about before because the force plates are going to pick up just the right the center right. of mass where it goes but i said are we talking about where they start re relative to where they finish or just the furthest point in either side like there's so many different right. ways to there's look so at many it. there's so many ways to look at it and then and then it becomes and that's what i mean by that's actually probably a better thing for what what you meant by when i said can you give an example where it's like right so what happens when you have 45 degrees as a limiting factor and you get a 44 yeah like that's not but it's yeah. way closer than a zero yeah <laughs> I have to, I mean, and I know you've, you've, uh, was it strength lab you, uh, taught here? It was a sports medicine lab. Oh, oh that's right. For uh, yeah. CBAC. So that's, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that probably fits right in. And I've done Kines lab once mm -hmm. and then clinicals, um, for senior students. And we talk all, I talk all the time about being careful with finding like the one thing that you think is going to be the right. answer to all the problems. And it seems to be like, ankle dorsiflexion is going to be the thing that fixes everything Always. yeah and, and it's like... it, constantly <laughs> constantly yeah if only it were that simple <laughs> right and, and and you know the last point which i don't think i said but but i i gotta give credit to the the camps that like really stick to their guns like you know there's multiple solutions and like if you have a model that you like and it works mm -hmm. keep keep doing it yeah if, if yeah if you're doing it like Let's talk about strength and conditioning. If you're doing a five by five training program versus triphasic versus, uh, I don't know, let's just say German volume and mm -hmm. you're getting stronger on all of them, keep doing all of them. I don't know mm -hmm. what to tell you. Like if you're getting the results you want, your yeah, program's if you, working. If you're, if you're no a responder, it's, uh, I mean, even like even the best research, right? If 85% if of people are responding to one type of program, you know, 15% weren't and something else, something different might work for them. That Right. It's uh right. so it's, you always got yeah you always got to see what's happening in front of you and exactly that's, and yes. that was that was the lens that Lee always brought to the training yeah. sessions and teaching was like tr you know trust what's happening in front of you and don't feel like you always have to fix everything right right it, exactly if, if you are gonna make a change you better be sure that it's gonna be a positive one right right uh, no, that's, that's an awesome point, but yeah, no. So, so that, that's, that's kind of my spiel and, and kind of rough guidelines. Um, yeah, that's great. And it makes, makes me feel good about the, the exercise I did this morning working on uh freshman. So we're trying to add, we, we've, we've been adapt, you know, um, trying to improve and tweak the EX 100 course for the last okay. few years now. Awesome. And, uh, so I'm trying to add some more like actual exercise and programming to it. And, uh, so that, and that's what I did. I went through and, and broke down the real basic movement patterns. Yeah. Like, which is here's awesome. A, here's a simple way to balance your programs. If you just hit these major movement patterns two to three times a week, uh, you know, that's really, it's not a hard and fast rule, but it's going to set you up, uh, to, yeah. to, to really For success. see what works For and, something. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to give a shameless plug here, but I will, um, <laughs> the, the game changer for me was in 2016. 17, I took Dr. Pat Davidson's Rethinking the Big Patterns mm. course. Um, and he he uses the scientific method and taxonomy to just break down the patterns and break down kin kinematics and kinetics and just like fills in the what you don't have or fills in the blanks. And when you look at it from a, that rational standpoint, it's very simple where it's like the end of the day, like 
you know, no disrespect to people, again, someone's probably going to see this and yell at me, no disrespect to people who do like lunch matrices, but like, what's the difference yeah. between a diagonal lunge and something else? Like, can they, there is a difference. Yeah. Is it the secret? Probably not. <laughs> and, and the analogy he used that I, that I will never forget, and I use it constantly, um, is that if you look at a shortstop playing baseball, and there's, you play baseball, so you'll appreciate this, how many ways are there to have a double play? Infinite. Yeah just yeah. based on where the ball is hit. Do you practice all of those? No. Yeah. Because the body self organizes. Yeah, so that's... really what I need is probably like yeah. a unilateral knee bend. And it's like funny you use that example because I, I, I think I brought that up with Justin because it, it was like the day after he had made a post about that. Really? And, okay. and, I, and so I was like, this is such a great example. Like you, it's yeah, unbelievable. The, yeah. Bot, the self organization is, is huge. And you can take that too far in and of itself. Uh, but like, it's such a big part of how we compete. Like you can't get a thousand reps in every exact situation. Right. You have to hit the major, right. the major landmarks. Right. Um, and then you figure out in individual yeah. situations what you know right and, and you know i always think like what is the art of coaching and i think that's really is where it's like really part the first half is seeding out what really matters and the second half is like how can i relay this to my population yeah um yeah. and that bridge is a tricky bridge between the two of those and the and you know but it's uh yeah so so always always yeah. and you've got you know you, you know different types of athletes that respond to different types of coaching and i'm sure For i'm sure, sure it, where you are it's got to be you've got to get the extremes uh yeah from, yes and no yeah yeah Do you, is there a big language barrier in the in the uh, uh room how's uh how's no, that work no um i had more of a language barrier in the private sector uh, um but you know i i learned really fast back in 2016 um try to limit as much cueing as possible and i i actually learned this from from throwing um there was like this is like old school internet forum days there was one called the ring which you know it was like judd logan would post all the time and like larry judge would post so it was like high-end coaches yeah. um and i didn't appreciate it back then kind of like how we've been talking all day um but they were like at, at a competition level you don't need more than five syllables because anything else the brain just won't listen so i use a lot of physical cueing um and i i again i stole this from pat davidson um and now we could go like really into the rabbit hole if you want but it's like if you look at the homunculus and look at like where our reference centers are like the hands are massive sensory um areas of our body so if you need someone to hip shift and you put your hands put their hands on their own hips mm -hmm. it makes the world of a difference so mm -hmm. stuff like that you know a lot of visual cueing a lot of feeling um my word and this kind of probably comes from my pri background as well the words i use are very little yeah that's like that, probably two tops that's cues. that's like really it'll good just be like, it'll it'll mostly be external output cues so like fast mm -hmm. or explode or let's that's, go like, that's a know. really good point and this is something that's a challenge i think in the coaching world and i've i've spent a lot of time working with like youth 10, 11, 12 yeah. year olds or high school. I will school. say you, you changed everything for me. And I've ran some clinics yeah. where it's impossible. They don't even know what you're talking about or yeah. care. <laughs> and one of the challenges I've run into is that's always been my approach. Exactly what you just said, trying to limit the amount of coaching and cueing uh, because it is, it's, it's so overwhelming. Uh, but then you get like parents and the sport coaches that think if you're not correcting every, and, and then they're yelling from the sideline, do this, you know, move your arms, you know, it's, and, and they've got multiple voices in their ear. And that's something I always struggled with. And like, hey, like, you know, take take a breath. Like, they'll be all right. Right, <laughs> right, right. And, you know, this, this I, I, I totally agree. And, you know, this comes to what kind of matters. And there, there's one thing could be self-organizing for the rest. So, like, let's just talk about, like, a sprint start. I think that's probably a good example where it's, like, if you are able to cue a shin drop at the beginning, and I know that some camps say do it, some don't and that fixes the second step, then you're done. So you don't even have to worry about the second, you know? And I see, I've seen people hit 35 things at once, you know, and th this is also the problem with a lot of internet coaching. Um, no disrespect to anyone who works at it, but it's like, you know, you're giving a full analysis and it's like, when I have a maximal effort attempt at anything, all that's right out of the window. I'm not even thinking about that. Yeah. 
um, nor do I care. <laughs> back to the, those forums you were talking about. So I used to interact quite a bit in uh, the old strength coach forums. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Those were also, and, yeah. That was Brett, awesome back in the day. <laughs> yeah. Brett Contreras was super active in that. Right. In yep. those, and he used to talk about that. Like, you know, having an allowance for mechanical breakdown at higher intensities, which was counterintuitive to what I thought at the time. Right. You know, at under 90%, you basically want every rep to be perfect. Like you don't want to break down, but once you get above that 90%, like you got to one, trust yourself. And then two, yeah. like just, just let it go. Cause you're, yeah. the, your volume is so low at that intensity. Anyway, uh, the, the thousands of reps at the lower intensities, if, if you're breaking down is where the, the main issue is probably going to be. And that absolutely kind of changed my thinking. Yeah, no, and it's a great point. And it, you know, you know, the one thing I've, come to appreciate is that the body will take the path of, of the most efficient means possible. Um, and whether that means some internal rotation impingement, so be it, you know, I like it happens. We don't want to live there at all times, but we don't want to avoid it if it happens either. Yeah. So it's, it's so again, you, relative. Uh, you mentioned, so obviously you have a huge throwing background and, and just, yeah. I know you wanted to touch on this. I, I Maybe we already did. I don't remember if we were recording yet just how that coaching background has, has shaped who you are yeah. now from, the, tr from yes. the track and field standpoint. Yeah. So, so, I mean, so I, I talked about, you know, the two books that I originally got, but then the third, you know, I like looking for the best things that I can get. So I looked up like literally Google at like 16 years old, best throws coach. <laughs> and I come across Dr. Bonachuk, who I is probably like, number one influence on my life in, in the strength world. And then I actually worked with John Godina as a personal coach um, who, who was a, the most decorated shot putter of all time. Um, but, but so, so I ordered transfer training one and two, like shortly after the, the super training. And again, this is right from elite FDS. Thank God they stocked all these unbelievable Russian texts back yeah. in the day. Man, um, going through these at 16 years old is that's wild to think about. I yeah, think. And, and I and you know I come back and I still don't understand. I still didn't appreciate all of it, but I was looking at like specific measures and what I needed. So so I understood that exercise classification and whatnot. And you know, if if you've looked at this or whoever ends up watching this looks or book then you know it's really cool because he literally ran like spss on all all the stats of all the russian athletes that he worked for for four olympic games so we're talking wow what's that for 16 to 20 year pool of athletes so that's a lot so yeah. it was every level of every discipline um and what had the highest uh p value which was like still i'm in awe of how cool that is so it was yeah. like really what are key performance indicators? Yeah. You know, we call it that now. He was not calling it that. Um, and then using that to make coaching decisions. So it's twofold what, what my own influence is and, and anyone who's worked in these disciplines can know um, because it's, well, it's probably threefold. First is, is really seeding out what matters and when it matters. Um, and learning how to do the traditional periodization. Like I, I remember like I taught myself how to peak at in high school, which was cool. Wow. Um, you know, like a true taper, like true linear periodization. So um, did, was, did you not have a, was there not a specific throwing coach or? There was, there was. Um, and I was very fortunate. I was part of a club too, but we didn't do any of the weightlifting. It was kind of oh, just wow. like that all was, technical. You were on your own for that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, so learning, you know, learning that side of it from trial and error and luck, just like this happened to be the source, you know, I was very fortunate, um, really shaped a lot to, you know, something that's really interesting about the throws and most events is like, based on archetypes, and I, you know, I might want to talk about this later when it comes just to athletes as a whole, when it comes to archetypes, I would be get I would get beat by smaller people and I would get beat by taller and weaker people. Like there was no consistency um, in the throws, and it like really taught me to kind of look at what you needed as a person. Or you know, I ended up also coaching throws um, in 2017 as well. But 
there's many ways to achieve the goal that you want. Yeah. Um, and I, and I think, I think the disciplines of track and field really show that in the sense where it's like, you know, at the highest level being the Olympics, there's like a standard height, weight, you know, archetype. But like, if you look at a college track and field event, I mean, like the 800 is a great one, in my opinion, you see, you see runners who are, and I'm talking about males who are like six to 180 pounds and you mm -hmm. see five to 135 pounds. Like there's no consistency and it, and it just kind of shows the adaptability of the human body, which is like really, really cool um, to look at from like a scientific standpoint. Um, so those two were huge. And then the third was like really just, just, trusting the process um and using data so 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 you know using bonachuk systems literally what i would do was measure he has a classification system whether it's it's accurate or not i don't know but it, it again this is a model that warranted the results um so you would measure your best training throw of all day of the practice per the implement you're using and looking at your results and then kind of just see how you respond to stimulus okay um and then using that to guide your decisions. So, so, I mean, I have Excel files from like 2012, where it was like a hundred days of throwing where, and then you just mark it out on a, a graph and you could say that, okay, if I throw a heavy implement this day, two days later, I had a spike in my performance. That's a, that shows my trends. Um, so that really has developed a lot of my like current philosophies for training. Um, that's in the that's sense, super interesting. That's yeah. And, and for at that age to be able to do that. And yeah, it was really cool. Um, it was really cool. And again, I, I kind of just trusted it because I was like, one, uh, this guy's Russian, which I back then, you know, <laughs> thinking about Rocky, but I was like, that's all you they need. were the cutting edge. And yeah. this guy coached the two world records in the hammer throw. Um, so like, you know, and like looking back now, I'm like, that was really cool because, you know, right now my current model that I use um, is that every workout isn't used for the current workout, it's to prep for the next athletic event. So mm -hmm. like I'll have, and, and it comes from a, a lot of the people at Omega Way, but you know, there'll be like a stimulatory day, a developmental day, or like a regeneration day. And then this ties back to like Dr. Moran because I was, I've been running a ton and I've been writing my own running program, but we learned the Jack Daniels method of, of V dot yeah. and running. And I look at that and that's what he has. He has developmental days. I'm like, these yeah. are just universal laws of yeah. training. You know, yeah. these exist. And I didn't I, appreciate I, that then. I told him I did, I did my grad work at Ithaca. Okay. And, and we had to, uh, you know, we did a, we had to develop a training program for somebody and we had a marathoner or a, she was a distance runner as an undergrad that wanted to transition into marathons. So everything we used was basically from Jack Daniels. And that, right. that's when I learned that Dr. Moran had, had stepped in for him. Yeah, in Portland. yeah, which is, which like, again, I don't understand how big that is, but I know it's big now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's, it's no joke, but uh, right. But, but, but then, you know, this is something and, and this goes kind of back to my journey and this goes back to like everything else where it's like, these are universal laws of physiology that mm -hmm. exist. So whether it's rehab, whether it's running, whether it's strength conditioning, the stimulus response needs to be appreciated. And like, I remember I was, we had the exact same project in masters where it's like, you, you have this archetype that you have to write a training program to. It could have been a 5k a marathon, whatever. And I was like, I have no idea how I'm going to do this. And I'm like, no, this is just volume and load and managing intensity. It's like, yeah, yeah I actually can't do this. And just yeah. progressive overload. It exists. What's, what's the finish line and, and work backwards. That was, right. you know, running's a great, uh, I think a great way to practice that because it is, like you said, it's, it's so focused on the volume and, and you know, the speed that they want to run and right. you can control all those variables in practice. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's uh, yeah, yeah, it was a good, good practice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm still not very good with the data management as far as I, I, uh, I'm getting a lot better and, you know, we're doing a lot of research with the rowing team and collecting oh, right. like just lots of different information, anthropometrics and, and performance measurements when we can. This, this semester has been tough, obviously, with, with yeah. COVID. Uh, but, you know, using that to, to look at what trends we can find and what's working and what's not and hopefully yeah. help, help the, uh, 
the right. sport coaches out with it. So, right. Cause I mean, at the end of the day, that's, that's the big takeaway. Like, is this relevant to performance and to the coaches? Yeah, and I think, you we know, could, we could give them a 45 page, you know, uh, binder of every single thing and how it correlates, how every variable correlates to each other. But, you know, is this something that the coach can actually make use of and improve what they do? Yeah. Yeah, I really, a long way. one of my favorite teams I ever worked with was swimming and diving. And, yeah. and it was for that reason. Well, a couple of reasons. One was the coach was really good. She tracked every practice, their, mi awesome. their mileage in the pool or their yardage in the pool mm -hmm. and the, and the results over time. And also when they started lifting and how many days a week they were lifting so she could see the impact that it had. And it just created so much buy-in uh, yeah. from, from the athletes. Like I've, I've worked in some sports where, strength should be a no brainer, but it wasn't at the time, it wasn't uh, traditionally a, a sport that bought into, well, if you, mm -hmm. you know, if you get stronger, it's going to help my game. Baseball being right. one of, one of them. Yeah. Um, I think it's starting to come or it has come around finally, but yeah, from what I see it has, um, yeah, 20, but it's also hard. I don't know if it's just like true meathead teams, like the places I've been, the teams couldn't get out of the weight room. And I'm like, Oh, I guess baseball came around. <laughs> uh, I, we had uh, when I was at RPI, we we would let the uh, the local. It was a New York Penn League team for the Astros mm -hmm. would would work out in our uh, in our gym, but like not everyone would come. Right. Uh, so the minor league coordinator came in and he's like, "Yeah, like some some of them just aren't gonna aren't gonna yeah. show up." Especially like a lot of it was cultural. Like I think a lot of the the Latin guys. Were, you know, they were, they, it was their first experience in the U S so they're probably intimidated to begin with. Um, but then like, if they've never been in a weight room to come to a weight room and try to figure out etiquette and yeah. how to use things and how to, yeah. how to move, it's, it's, you know, yeah. I mean, thank you bigger about a good point that I, uh, I'll just piggyback off of that where it's like, not only is it, is there cultural discrepancies in training that I see, but there's also an experience. And I think as a coach, we have to appreciate that because, you know, and I, I look at it myself, like there's, there's obviously many routes to get where you want to go, but if, if, you know, let's talk about this minor league baseball, let's talk, let's just leave it to college athletics. Like mm -hmm. playing division one is a privilege and, and not everyone gets to do it. If you got there doing one route, yeah, you have trust in your own system. You don't want to change that. So, so there's a balance that I find as a clinician, as a strength coach, as a person where it's like, you know, if it's, I don't want to say if it's not broke, don't fix it, but it's, it's a delicate balance of like showing them that you care and that we have the same goals as them. And also like you also, there's things in, you know, this is like in the PRI realm where it's like, I don't push it on everyone that I've ever worked with, but what, but I knew that they could have used it, but there's a point where you have to let them get to the point of no return. And then you're like, okay, yeah. I'm here. I know, I know what you need. And then that really creates the buy-in. Yeah. But, that's I a, mean, uh, that's, that's a great way to put it. Great. Yeah. Great point. Um, yeah. So like, do you see, and obviously without going into detail, like, do you see that where you are? Like when, when guys come in, do you have to feel them out as to, as far as like what their background is and what they're um, going to buy into? Honestly, you know, and I, I can't get into the specifics, but I think from from me as a clinician, whether no matter where the setting is, that's something that I I look at. So 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 it's like you know I'll use an example of um, you know a, a a friend's mom that I had worked with, like her training experience and mine is going to be completely different, and I have to be selflessness enough to let go of my own emotional attachment. Yeah. and still figure out how to work with them. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. And while I do that, I also have to keep in the back of my mind, this has to be relevant enough to actually get what we intend to get done. Um, and that kind of goes into the art of coaching. So, 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 you know, whether it's a specific population or not, it doesn't really change for me. It's just how I function at this point as a clinician. Mm -hmm. and it's the same with, with exercise or with uh, athletic training. Like, I, throughout my entire time as an athletic training the past five years, like I, I've had unique skill sets, whether it be using biomechanics, whether it be using breathing and repositioning and people look at it weird, <laughs> yeah. um, whether it be coworkers, whether it be patients, whether it be private clients, you know, mm -hmm. try getting someone to pay money. And then you're going to tell them we're going to spend 35 minutes breathing. Like, you're not going to have clients. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a delicate balance of seeing what they 
want what they need and what you can give them yeah and you know that comes that really comes to the the art of it Mm -hmm. um and and, uh, probably the best recent advice i got was from my friend jamie pasquin who is a fellow graduate as well and he was like he's been he's been working with clients and, and coaches and he, he's a deep thinker, but he was saying, you know, I reflected at, at what, who would I want as a coach? And am I the coach that I would want? And as soon as you think that, like, I wouldn't want someone just, but maybe some people would, you know, there, there's a, a great book I read is called The Four Tendencies by uh, Gretchen Rubin. And it's basically that there's four archetypical people about how they respond, whether it's external or internal motivation. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's like the people who are like externally motivated and internally motivated. So they're, they're like, you know, your type A, like they're going to get it done. Then there's like the people who are very low in both. Like there's no external, internal. Those are the people that if I give you a program, you're going to do it no matter what. Yeah. Um, so appreciating that and, and learning that has gone a long way for me because I'm like, there are people who, who want to be told what to do. And there are people who are going to question what to do. There are people who are just going to do it regardless. Mm-hmm. And then there are people who are never going to do it. And as soon as, the, it, and you know, I, um, the, the other book is probably way more specific is um, Conscious Coaching. He, he mm-hmm. uh, Brett Bartholomew did a great job archetyping the types of athletes. I, I think he does 16. I think that's a lot personally. Yeah. Um, yeah. Less is more in my opinion, but, but no judgment. I, I thought it was a great read and worthwhile, but but as soon as you appreciate that, it's like, yeah, great. You know, I've worked with people who they want to be told exactly what they do. They look at a program once, never ask me one question the rest of their life. Yeah. And then I have some people that will never do it. And I'm like, mm-hmm. that's, that's what it is. That's the world. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but putting my own agenda aside and meeting them in the middle ground is, is, is the challenge and the goal with every yeah. decision. I think that goes back to what you said earlier too, about, you know, experience does matter. Like, right. It, exactly. It is exactly. Hard. And, and, you know, you see a shared a lot um, more recently, like the Dunning Kruger effect. And you see that a lot in coaching where two years in so many people think they have all the answers and, and it hurts. Like it hurts the ego. If someone doesn't buy into what you're trying to, to right. sell them, you know, and it's absolutely eventually you get to the point where like, yeah, you know what, I've made a lot of mistakes. Maybe sure. I should, should, uh, you know, take, take other people's responses to it. It's just, it's just feedback. Just like you said, you always want an external audit. Like your clients are, are a natural source of an external audit for you, I think. Right. And right. What's and especially, and what's not. Yeah. And especially if you, that's your only basis in a, in a personal training or a private sector where it's like your life depends on it. You learn really fast. Like, yeah, I can't live financially if I don't. Yeah. And, yeah. and we, you know, like, you know, going back to the money conversation, whether it's, whether it's right or wrong. And just like you, I don't think there's anything inherently that's all good or all bad, but that's how we keep score. Like if you you can write the best programs in the world, but if you don't have any clients, it's, it's, you know, it's what good is it? What's the point? Right. 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 And, and, you know, that's that, again, that comes as theory and application. I absolutely, absolutely. I'll never forget, uh, like a like just like random wisdom as such where you know it goes back to writing the best the best programs uh ryan gleason who owns gleason performance in derby connecticut um it's a friend of mine and i, I trained on and off there for a couple of years now but we were talking programming one day and he's like yeah week one you know i do three sets of accessories and week four i do or week two i do four sets and then week three I do four sets again. I was like, why not five? He's like, I just make it heavier. I'm like, is there a reason? He's like, yeah, because no one wants to do five sets. My clients complain to me all the yeah. time. And I'm like, yeah, it gets a ton. That's, yeah. there you go. Like, you just, I like you, it. Good enough. <laughs> yeah, I'm, that's one thing I'm going to touch on with my students. So he, he, at the end of the day, you, and Eric Cressy is the one that first like made this point to me because I asked him, I'm like, he was writing these really specific programs. And I, yeah. I was like, how do you, like, how do you know, like this program is what I need right now i wasn't like questioning him like i didn't think it was right but what's your thought process and he's like you know at the end of the day you just you need to be able to rationalize everything you put in the program and it it might at the you know five years down the road you might look back and say that that wasn't uh wasn't correct or wasn't exactly what we wanted it to be but you need to be able to rationalize it you can't just put it in and what your clients want is a rationalization like you know you can't yeah or or for those in the college those in the college setting, what your coaches want. 
I, yes. I'll never forget. I, I would, I always, I love looking at other people's programs and talking shop and I would see some college coaches and I'm like, why do you do like 10 minutes of like self myofascial work? Like you already hit the, and they're like, our coach wants us to have an organized activity 10 minutes before we lift. And I'm like, okay, great. I love it. You know? And yeah, they're like, I've, this isn't going to cause any harm. And yeah, there you go. I, my, uh, my, my direct boss, my manager, when I was at RPI was, uh, also an assistant baseball coach and okay. I worked baseball was one of my teams. I'll never forget kind of him storming down into the weight room when he heard that I had is had the pitchers doing like a one arm dumbbell bench press. Like you would have thought I just oh yeah no, ruined the, ruined their season, right. um, and it's like that was one of those times like my ego took a hit, but I had to like yeah you have to I had adapt. to one def defend myself and you know mm -hmm. not in a defensive way but rationalize like what we were doing, but at the end of the day if they didn't buy into it, it didn't matter right. what my rationalization was yeah. right right yeah oh I got it no it's uh. Again, and that, that's that comes to experience and learning how to program and s seeding out decision making. Yeah. How you know using with that thought process, like, and and you probably have to talk about this more if you can from a standpoint like at a place like Prentice, uh, we had a similar type environment with more more so with football um, mm -hmm. in New Jersey where we'd get a lot yeah, of guys yeah. that were either you know, di very different situations, you know, guys just out of college who were not invited to the combine, were just hoping to get a workout or a pro day all mm -hmm. the way to guys that had signed. I mean, you know, at one point we were working with guys that had signed record contracts. Right. Right. Um, yeah, so yeah. like, even though they're all football players and they may even be the same position, like to, to us, those are two very different approaches. Like how, how do you approach those, you know, those different yeah, so so I think I think that's a really great question, um, and, and I think I mean, I'm just pulling up my my notes here. Someone someone had asked something about like difference makers or difference between adolescents and pros or adolescents mm -hmm. and adults, and, and I think I, I'm going to lump all this into one, um, where it's like you know, the bell curve exists for a reason in in science, and you know I think if you start grouping things into archetypes or at least into buckets, it makes decisions easier. So the example I'm going to use, and I, I never worked with him. So if he sees this one day, I guess mm -hmm. this is a great shout out to him. But, but if you look at Mike Boyle's program, he's someone who, who constantly is talked about both positive and negative light. Um, if you look at his, his program, and I don't know if you have, or your students have, but it's, it's very straightforward and simple. Yeah. Like it's not sexy. But yeah, it works. Yeah. It works very, very well for what it's intended to do. And I've know people that have worked there, I've known as athletes, and I've heard nothing but great things. And I'm I will never judge a program by just looking at it because there's so many situations that come in. But with that being said, I, I remember thinking like I'm like, man, this is the program for for an Olympic caliber athlete. And you know, when you look at skill development, it's that bell curve of what they actually need. So it comes down to like at that level, like they probably don't need as much strength and conditioning as specific skill work. And this goes right back to Bonachuk. And this is something that like throwing has taught me where it's like, as you get better at your sport or your goal, you know, let's talk runners, let's talk strongman. Like strongman is a great one. I've competed in that for a while. I don't need to get stronger at squatting. I need to know how to move the implements. I need specific strength um, mm -hmm. or I need to work on that, that bottom chuck competitive exercises. So, so, you know, that comes down to the art of coaching. And I think that there are probably some, some traditional testing you can do. And I, I, I talk about that a little bit. It's not my test, um, but kind of bucket into what they need. Um, and that, that's, that's a hard thing to do. Um, but it's a deal breaker, you know, and, and I think that that as you you obviously there comes to a point where everything's a skill and it's just like, how good are you at the skill? Yeah. But I also think that you also need that external audit like football is a great example because, you know, that's how we started off. But it, but there's so many archetypical types, you know, you have linemen, you have defensive ends, you have offensive line. Like, in my opinion, those are two different physiological oh, positions. Yeah. yeah. Then you have, you know, your skill guys and you have your quarterbacks. Like, so we're talking about like seven yeah. different programs at this point. Oh yeah. And um, you know, we would, you get... also have to look at, go ahead. 
Oh, no, fin- go ahead, finish. No, I was just going to say, you also have to look at what they use in their sport to get where they are. Mm-hmm. So, like, you know, uh, I'll talk about an offensive lineman. You could have someone who's 6'8", 350 pounds. That's not uncommon. Mm-hmm. They could not be very strong, but you're not moving them. Or you could get someone who's 6'4", 300 pounds, who's smaller, but that's not much smaller. Um, but they're 800-pound squatter. So it's yeah. like, right, what do they need to get better at their sport? Mm-hmm. And that that's what it comes down to. So that's where I think like pre-testing and assessment is huge. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of like, like we, we could bring it back to sprinting. Um, you know, it's like, how do you get faster? Like look at, like break everything down, like hierarchical, like what is force? It's mass times acceleration. So I could lose weight and get faster mm-hmm. or I could produce more acceleration. You know, yeah. or so so it really comes down to what are the constructs of a specific thing and what is the rate limiting factor. And that's something that I've begun to appreciate tremendously. Um, is try to find that rate limiting factor for a specific archetype and you know, use testing, see if the program's working, and then modify. Yeah, that's uh, that's such a it's such a simple concept, but gets overlooked, I think, so much. And so much, and it's really easy because it's not sexy. Right. Yeah. And then like, you know, chemistry, it's like you learn that. Right. Right. This is what I go back to the scientific method where like I did a lit review, the like during during this time period of um, repeat sprint ability um, or repeated power outputs. And it's like there's probably, you know, five to seven rate limiting factors and you're going to have five to seven answers of your team why this person isn't producing or why this specific person. So like in theory, you need five to seven programs. Yeah. Yeah. And like the modifications you make really aren't that different. It's that like someone squatting at like 1.0 meters per second, someone squatting at 0.6. Like, there you go. Okay. You're both yeah. squatting. Get, get the velocity up. Yeah. Right. You're right. But you know what I mean? So it's like, I, I think that's, that's the lens I look at it. And, and I think that that really streamlines your approach and makes you better coach and makes decisions much more efficient and better. That's really, really good stuff. Uh, you know, one thing we would run into also, especially in the, that situation with the football guys, uh, you know, let's say you have like a lineman who's going to a pro day or combine and maybe his weakest point is a vertical jump or something. Right. And it's like, I might not feel as a coach that the best thing for him physically is to spend time <laughs> working on working on necessarily jumping. Right. But if a coach is going to see a a two inch increase and, and get excited about it. Um, it might be worth the risk reward where if you have a yeah. guy that's, that's already inked, you know, inked a deal, uh, for sure. Now it's just keeping them on the field and right. Right. Yeah. It's whole, a whole different mindset. It's a balance. No, absolutely. And, you know, I think in my opinion, like when I read a program, most of the programs I read at this point are for myself, um, I like put myself as a guinea pig all the time, but it's like, I do a need, need assessment. Yeah. Um, and it's like, right. So for that specific so do you, architect, do you do that for yourself or do you, do you bring anyone else into the process when you're writing your own program? I do it for myself, but I have been coached by other people in the past. Um, but a lot of times it's just my own, um, wanting just to test things out before mm-hmm. I do it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of like a beta trial, <laughs> right? right that's, um, a, that's the best way to do it yeah right right um but right but like so for this you know this football player we're talking about the needs assessment is like he needs to get his vertical jump up mm-hmm. there that's it that yep. trumps everything so yep. okay great we could do that mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. so it's uh again not really flashy not gonna make you a million dollars selling that that tip yeah. um Will it work 100 percent of the times? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I love that approach. Now, like, so we haven't even touched on this yet, really, for the most part. But I know we wanted to talk about it. Yeah. Um, with your background in in uh, uh, PRI, postural, postural mm-hmm. restoration. Yep. So, you know, how did you start on that path? How many of the courses have you taken? I've myself, I've only taken Myokin um, with with James. And, and had a oh, great yeah, yeah. experience, yeah. Uh, but yeah. I haven't, I haven't been to another course since and, you know, for a few different reasons, but uh, I, I would like to do more, but um, mm-hmm. you know, how has that influenced your philosophy or lens as a coach and, 
And how do you see that influencing the, the field moving forward? Yeah, I, I think that's an unbelievable talking point. Um, so my first exposure, I haven't even got here on my journey yet. So in 2016, I went to Quinnipiac okay. University <laughs> um, with Coach Rajesh Patel, who uh, yeah. is, is probably the most single um, biggest influence in my journey in strength and conditioning and fitness. Don't, and, don't mind me for a second, Joe. I'm yeah, going to no switch to a standing desk here. Yeah, yeah, my, yeah uh... that's fine. That's fine. Um, so, so when I got there in 2016, I walked into a weight room that was unlike anything I've ever seen. And I think any, and he'll laugh hearing this and he knows that I knew this. Uh, but I think anyone who goes there thinks the same way. I mean, this was like, the attention to detail was insane. And the changes in terms of programming design was unlike anything I saw. And the things that were going on were really cool. And the fluidity looking back was unbelievable in the sense that I would bring things from my lens and background and within like 10 seconds of talking, it was changing the program that day um, just to see if it worked. And, you know, he, that's in my opinion, probably one of his best skills amongst many that he, he, it's not afraid to take risks in terms of adding things, changing things, whatever, and experiment. Very and, cool. Yeah, it was awesome. It, it was, it was the single most, one of the single most, uh, time periods of growth in my life. Um, so, so and when how I got long there, were you there? 20, 2016 to 2017? I was there the entire fall of 2016 um, into the winter. And then that's because it was by semester. And then that spring, I was finishing on my thesis, but I would still come hang out like religiously, like weekly at that point, just to learn and talk shop. Um, so, you know, like a huge staple of his performance is, is like aerobic capacity, which was like, I mean, I'll never forget, and this is a funny story. We, we he would make us do the training program with him, um, and a couple of pros that were training there at the time. And I remember it was like thirty seconds of jumping jacks, thirty seconds of like lateral splits, shuffles, and like just cal general calisthenics. I was so bagged from doing it that I, I remember puking. Wow! <laughs> and, and he. Uh, He'll never let me let that down. So, so there was a lot that changed. But anyways, I'm getting off topic. PRI was introduced to me there and they were okay. doing it a ton of preparation and I, I had no experience with it. Um, he was doing it a ton of preparation. So it'd be like, you know, your your A block would be like postural resets and it would be like your typical 90-90 hip lift, right mm -hmm. clamshell, left pullback. Mm -hmm. And then we go into like some like warm up and then your, your lift. And I was like, what is this? This is really cool. Um, especially being an AT. So he would explain it to me, I'm like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. And one of my best friends who I've already mentioned numerous times, Jamie, who, who um, he's a Springfield undergrad. So Springfield undergrads kind of who have been taught by Pat Davidson, mm -hmm. um, have like a huge PRI background because I know that it was, they, their exposure rate was huge. Mm -hmm. um, so Jamie was like, yeah, yeah, I know this man. Like, I know PRI. I'm like, really? That's cool. So let's talk about it. So we would talk constantly. And that's how I got introduced to my Camperini through Jamie. And we all just would like talk and experiment and just like live in a theoretical world. Um, but I was also applying, we were applying it at Quinnipiac. So we were seeing, like I was seeing like really cool stuff in the sense of, you know, the adduction drop test is something that that's like kind of the gold standard for measuring, um, you know, if you can, you can warrant changes in that. So we were looking at exercise selections and, you know, we were using them to warrant the results, but then I, I would, I would think about stuff. Well, like, okay, you know, I can get this goal through this exercise, but I could also get this goal from doing else. So like, you know, and I don't, I, I don't know what I can and can't say based on what they teach. Um, but like, and I'm not knocking their methodology and, and someone might have a better solution, but it's like, I'm like, you know, at the end of the day, it's biomechanics. So if I know that the pelvis needs to nutate, I'm like, okay, so let's look at this. Like someone stuck in extension or counter nutation. Let's have them do a reverse sled drag really heavy because they'll be forced to create that moment. And then sure enough, we would warrant the results. So I'm like, huh, I'm not stuck to one methodology mm -hmm. and this can now become strength and conditioning. Or it's like, you know, we talk about a ZOA, 
which is a zone of acquisition for those that don't know, where it's talking about like stacking a rib cage on a pelvis. So if I'm using my model here, you know, we don't want this, we want them equal or parallel. I'm like, huh, in a back squat, I need to create impingement for stability and strength and force reduction and internal rotation. So I need to have that extension. But if, and then I, you know, I was competing in strong and I'm like, if you look at a Zercher squat and by no means am I the one who discovered this, a lot of people are talking this, but I'm like, a Zercher squat has sound biomechanical principles. So I'm like, you know, maybe for that person, they just Zercher squat. Um, so at the time, you know, I was finishing a lot and then of school and I was working a lot and I was doing this internship on top of being a GA at night. Um, so that summer I took two courses within a period of like two months, which like, or two weeks, which looking back oh, was a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> I, did, I did postural at the end of June. And then I did pelvis in July, like the first okay. week or so. And just based on conversation, experimenting, having an anatomy background and talking to really good coaches who talk about it a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm really grateful that I got to talk to people like Pat Davidson, like Dan Sanzo at Northeastern, like Justin Moore, like Mike Camperini, they, like Michelle Boland is someone I yeah. talked to a ton who was a very good friend of mine um, who have really helped me because they get it. Pat Davidson is another one, you know, and it wasn't like I wanted to learn secrets. I was just curious. Um, mm -hmm. And, and this is a little aside, like I'm like forever grateful for the people that share free resources and knowledge just based on what they're passionate about mm -hmm. um, because it exists and you could really learn a lot. Um, so those people really had a profound impact on my, my development and still do. But so, so I was like, okay, I got to take one of these courses. So I wasn't overwhelmed because I had a really sound theory of it. Um, and then I was immediately like, okay, well, let's apply. And I was just applying to everything I could think of like anything that came into the athletic training room, anything that came into the gym, it was just considerations where I think like, you know, like, why wouldn't I program? Like, I'll give you an example. Why wouldn't I program a row with a uh, reciprocal motion? You know, like, am I that married to like a three point stance row for weight? Like it really doesn't matter. Right. Right. <laughs> like I'm just jacking up compression at the sake of like <laughs> gaining gaining more force production that's really not even true force production it's an illusion yeah so i'm just like what is the goal with this activity um and it, it explained a lot but at the end of the day it's 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 a biomechanical lens mm -hmm. and it, it's it's like you know people are are really married to the idea well this isn't backed in research this isn't back like well it is because it's biomechanics mm -hmm. you know like we breathe and we walk like that's it um, and, and, you know, there's certain things that I really love. Um, one is that like muscles are never off. They're just working differently. I think that's unbelievable. Um, and I think that like giving someone what they don't have, meaning like, you know, they'll say like, someone doesn't have a left hamstring working, let's give them a left hamstring. So it means do an activity, excuse me, that, um, gets their left hamstring in an orientation you want it. Yeah. Um, that has changed everything because I'm like, we should probably give people what they have and restore relative motion. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that necessarily means that you're married to like their exercise library, but right. I appreciate it and I use it a lot and it yeah. does come in need when you have to need it. Yeah, uh, that's that's a really good point. The, the lens is really, I think the, the value uh, and yeah. the exercises are the tools that help you. Uh, for sure, for but, sure. We, and we taught relative motion is, was the big one for me. And I didn't have that same, I was a biology major as an undergrad. Okay. So I didn't have the same introduction to um, anatomy and, and biomechanics until mm -hmm. down the road. Uh, but that made, that really clicked for me in, in that, like, a, you know, most joints can move from either end. And we usually, we think about a hip flexing or rotating, but we, we forget about the effect of the position of the pelvis on what, right. the, what the femur can do. It's like, oh, it's right. so there's nothing, there's, there's nothing magical about that line of thinking, but it's not, there's something. nothing magical, right? Yeah. No one's looking at it. And it's like, it goes back to, I don't know if this was before or early on, but when we were talking about increasing dorsiflexion, and it's like, that's like your true staple of it's like, well, why is dorsiflexed? Like, first of all, realizing that it's limited because it's already dorsiflexed is a huge mind blower to me. Yeah. I like, uh, it's funny. <laughs> I, I probably overuse it now, but like the, the elevator analogy, yeah, I'm like, yeah, you can't, no, you no. can't go up 10 floors. If, if you start on the third, if it's only right. a 10 floor building, like you have to, right, you have but to get I mean, back how, to... how many times do you see students, coaches, clinicians who it's like, 
oh, but my hamstring's tight. Let's stretch it. And it's like, no, it's already stretched. Mm -hmm. It's just that appreciate. Like, I remember that first time where I was just like, I had to like reconsider everything I've ever learned. Yeah. Yeah. No, seriously. It was, it was a lot. Yeah. Um, and I get why it's overwhelming. It's hard. I, get, I have a I hard keep... one. I asked Justin this question too, because I have a, a hard time balancing the information. One, I'm, I, I can't communicate this stuff at the level that like you or, or Justin or someone yeah. that's been through all those courses. can. But do. I, what I will say before we get further, I don't think it needs to be communicated that in depth. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah. We could circle back to that. Um, yeah. Uh, just as far as, uh, yeah, like what, yeah, what information I feed students that haven't been exposed to it yet. Cause it can send them down a rabbit hole of thinking. It can. Sure. It can, and it does, and it sends clinicians, I mean, to the point, like anyone who knew, knew me in 2016 or 2017, like, can attest that I was, like, insane. Um, <laughs> no, no, um, but it, it does, that. and I mean, it, it becomes to a point where it's like, okay, like, what are we actually looking at here, and why are we looking at this, and, you know, again, this becomes, like, a really big moment where it's, like, you know, it's great to know the fine details, like, I appreciate details, I think they make a difference, but it's, like, does it really matter? You know, I, I don't know. And I'm not trying to persuade students one way or another. You have to appreciate anatomy. You have to learn or like, that was one thing like looking back and I still think about this. I'm like, man, I did not care about origin and insertion at all at 18 years old. And that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just knowing a line of pull or pination of muscle fibers like yeah. actually means a lot. Matters a lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but again, that comes with experiences that you need to appreciate that. But with that being said, you know, it comes down to like, can the client, patient, athlete, whoever you're working with digest this and do they need to? And do they even need to know? Like at the end of the day, they don't even need to know what they're doing. And a lot of times like, you know, like I'll give you examples. Like a lot of times I can't even get someone supine where no matter where I am, because like, we don't have access. Like if you're on the road, like good luck getting 30 people in a hallway of an arena doing a 90, 90 hip lift. So yeah. I'm like, great. We just need to counter mutate. Let's do reverse retro walking or something. I, yeah. I don't know. I'm just making up a scenario okay. now, but like you have to be, you have to have a fluidity. Mm -hmm. And I think people get so married to the exercises in the finite detail that they don't see the forest through the trees. Mm -hmm. And that was really cool. And that was a lot of fun when I was at Quinnipiac because uh, me and coach Patel or Prajesh used to just experiment constantly It'd be like, okay, uh, we would do it on each other. It'd be like, okay, great. Let's, uh, you test my adduction drop. And then it's like, okay, pick an exercise. Cool. Search your squat. And we would just keep, do like, anything. Load. Yeah. Right. That's, and and you then learn. just retest and you would get, after. And that's, yeah, right. Right. And it was just like a quick test retest and we would see significant changes. So then it was like, huh, maybe I don't need to do 90, 90 hip lifts all the time. Maybe I just need to just like appreciate biomechanics. Um, and you know, not saying that you don't need to appreciate a 90 90 hip lift, but if you look at it, like look at it at a perpendicular angle, what's a 90 90 hip lift? It's a double knee bend, which is a squat. And that goes back to what we were saying like an hour and a half ago. It's a low load, low frequency, low intensity squatting pattern. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's the lens that it's given me. Um, like I can't say that there's something that I would always do or would never do. Um, because I think that would just be exhausting. You know, like I know coaches that are like, I would never do a TYI exercise again. And I'm like, well, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, or like now like clamshells are just getting like bashed online, which I think is hilarious. And I'm like, okay, like maybe I would, I, I really don't know. I, I, I you know, I, can't even it's, <laughs> I can't tell you. And, and I, so I'm, uh, I'm still able to train a couple of clients outside and, and I, the, you know, I tend to draw clients from, you know, like youth athletes. And yeah. also I have some gen pop, like I have a, you know, 70, 73 year old woman who I work with. And yeah, there's things I do with her that are exercises that five years ago, I might've said I'll never use again, but right. it, it, it's something that helps us along towards her goals. And exactly. it's not like, you know, it, and I see in the gym things happening. I'm like, Oh, I might not do it that way, but I, I've stopped judging trainers for what they do. Yeah. Or even uh, programs or exercises. And I, and yeah. I just have to also have an, an emotional attachment to it mm -hmm. for that reason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's crazy. And, and like, not to go on a huge aside, but I'm like, 
the world gets in a weird place, <laughs> especially fitness world. It might be the only world I know, but like people need, I feel like may need to reinvent themselves over and over again. So the stimulus of what it takes to be relevant just gets more obscure and crazier. Yeah. And you point and you're like, how did this point. get to this? That's I'm not going to give any specific names, but like, I mean, you'll appreciate this. Like early 2000s was just insane with this where it's just like, what is going on with training right now? Yeah. And like, this is what we're doing. <laughs> like, <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> and I, you know, I try to take even, even from things that I think are just completely out, you know, out in left field, there's usually, if they're successful for, from whatever lens you're looking through, whether it's the training results or just in the fact that they're building a huge community and they get buy-in from clients or whatever. Um, like I try to take like what, what works for them. Um, yeah. And you, usually there's something and that you might not agree with what they're doing exactly, but it doesn't mean you can't learn. You yeah, know, exactly. You mentioned that before. Exactly. And, and it's funny you say that because like I find myself getting on these kicks and one that I'm on and I'm not on it anymore because of what I did, but I'll tell you, I was just like barbell glute bridge is just like, it's gotta go. In my opinion. <laughs> I'm not a fan. I'm like, like the, it creates the set up the, the like it's... one, the setup to the amount of compression on the pelvis and three, like, it's like moving fake weight in my opinion. Like, cool. You barbell glue for 600 pounds. Like, I don't know what, <laughs> I don't even know what that means. So, so yeah. I posted a, I posed a question to my friends who are good individuals and I'm like, justify this exercise for me because I'm, I'm really trying to yeah. look for one. And someone was like, grappling sport specific strength i'm like there you go i like it good okay i would use this exercise now and it's like right you know yeah. back to bonachuk like that's a specific strength exercise for someone who needs to get out of the pin yeah yeah how yeah. am i replicating that and i like you know I, I went down that rabbit hole for that exercise too this was while i was RP, at rpi so probably yeah. 2000 baseball players love that 2010 I find, right i don't remember if that? i i don't remember if i used it with baseball players or not i just remember that's when i was uh more on myself and programming for certain okay. people, like individuals as opposed okay. to the teams because that was not yeah. like I, we actually had the space uh to do it if we wanted to our, our weight room for division three was insane uh but uh I remember reading, this was before he had written a book and before he had gotten really popular when Brett Contreras uh, was, yeah. you know, in those forums and talking about the, the force factors and, and like that kind of hit home for me, like, oh, you know, we, we don't really load hip extension in that plane very often. Um, so right. that like, that's where I, I started kind of liking it, but yeah. I've, I haven't used it in years now. Yeah. Right. And, and, and you know, I mean, this, this was like the most relevant example to me where I'm like, wow, nothing's really good or bad. Mm -hmm. Like it just, it just is. And yeah. I think that's, that's the appreciation. So it's like, right. You know, yeah. if I have an 80 year old client who for whatever reason, or I have a player who, who, or an athlete who, who is injured in, in a sling, like, guess what? We're going to probably have to modify. Mm -hmm. Or I have someone who for whatever reason hates barbells, like not, unrealistic mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah yeah, yeah that's yeah. that's so cool man. so 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 yeah go ahead no go for it no i was just gonna say like real quick circling back to pri you know i think that people are really turned off by by the 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 low intensity and the low frequency of the the exercises and then people constantly say like does it stick mm -hmm. um meaning that like if i do a 90 90 hip lift i get my pelvis in a position of neutrality quote unquote because that's in a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. And we know we'll say, you know, I warrant the results I want. And then I start a physical activity. Am I just going to go right back to my original mm -hmm. pattern? And, you know, then that's where training decisions come where it's like, you know, you have to increase capacity of those positions mm -hmm. and you slowly have to change what you're, you're doing. So, you know, whether it be standing, whether it be more load, whether it be more frequency, that's situational. Right. Yeah. And I, I kind of explain it just like any, any manual therapy, like, uh, or, or, uh, you know, uh, manipulations for, for PT. Right. So right, exactly. you're not, you're not like adjusting b bones because you know, what people think right. is happening, but you're giving yourself a, a, either a reduced or, or, you know, no pain window where right. now, now you can build tissue tolerance and capacity. Exactly. 
that didn't exist right you know immediately before yeah and, and i mean i mean chiropractors are another field that in my opinion get a bad rap and i'm yeah. like well really it's just relative like i don't know like yeah it's not a cure-all but if you get a really good chiropractor who then does neuromuscular re-education with you like you're gonna warrant the results you want mm -hmm. that's the same with pri so i'm like cool let's do a 990 hip lift and then let's repattern with zercher squats or isometrics and we'll get what we want so that's yeah. good stuff i got i got i was uh, you know, when COVID hit my, I initially in, intended to do one of the, one or two of the take home. Yeah. Courses, so so I, I I've done those as well. Those are great. Mm -hmm. So, so I've done the primary three, two have been in person, one has been a take home. And then I've done the two in person take home as well. And they're, they're well worth it. Okay, but I, but honestly, I, you know, and I'm not trying to take away from them because obviously you get CEUs and you get the, the teacher component, but read talk to coaches that's yeah. my biggest advice for everyone um and know their their experience with it for mm -hmm. anything anything i'm not just saying one thing like it goes a long way and this is something you know if i don't know if there's like a advice to student section but but go go to the source of water in the horse's mouth like i'll never forget i i would read stuff and just email the researcher themselves because i'm like oh i think that and people like to talk about themselves and <laughs> worst case they don't then mm -hmm. they don't respond you wasted 20 seconds sending it yeah email. it's not gonna hurt um Smart. or they see a disparity that they've never thought of before you know i remember a lot of like we talked about you talked about the uh the tendencies of the Prague school and whatnot. And then like written in the past, it's been like, why zebras don't get ulcer and Robert Sapolsky mm -hmm. shrine coaches love, which I get. And you I've know, got that. That's on my shelf here. I yeah. It's, sure. a, it's a great read, but, yeah. but I mean, like it always kills me when strength coaches are like, this is the most influential book in strength and conditioning. Like it's probably not, it's probably yeah. not. <laughs> the, the most influential is probably the book that you need. I don't know what that is, but it's yeah, like, yeah. Where people say like, that's how deep. to win friends. <laughs> yeah. Uh, welcome. Welcome to my life. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> But that's another question like what do you recommend i don't know what do you need like let's start there but uh but like i think like you know reach out to those people like they don't even know what our world is like at all or care to but they might come at it with that that external audit lens that it's like huh this is valuable or this could be this or you know yeah. so it's it's uh it's really cool so man this is awesome we're going on two yeah. hours now yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I, th I think we hit on most of the stuff that we wanted to talk about. Is there anything else you wanted to add or, or just a message um, to the, the students here or just in general that you want to? Yeah, I, I, there's a couple of things, uh, if you don't mind. Yeah. I mean, we've talked about everything that I wanted <laughs> to. The, the biggest thing, that last point is something that I, I, I really value and it. it's made me a better coach, person and clinician is really just you know, have a curious mind, ask why, and don't be afraid to reach out for, for questions and help, uh, you know, and don't take it personally if people don't, don't um, answer you or help you. Like they don't owe it to you, but mm -hmm. you made the effort. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the other thing I will say is use, use your resources to advantage. And this is something, and I don't wanna say I pride myself on, but I find myself doing more than not. There are so many free resources in the world especially in strength and conditioning. We're a very giving community, fitness as a whole. We live in a, a time period where there's more information than ever. There's more podcasts that are specific. Um, immerse yourself in whatever you you find. And if you don't know what it is, go out and explore. You know, I remember when I was first getting into PRI, I immersed myself in every, I looked up PRI on P Apple Podcasts and listened to every single one I could find, even if it was just background noise. Um, you know, another person, not, not, uh, they, um, now I'm going to forget his name, the David Ramsey, but R Tony Robbins talks about oh. this. It's like <laughs> his factors are so simple where it's like total immersion. It's like, yeah. right. You know, that downtime when you're driving, throw on a podcast about something, even if it's just background noise, you will absorb something. Yeah. Uh, and, and they're, they're free. Uh, use YouTube. YouTube is unbelievable a resource. I recently found myself and I'm going to use this as a shameless plug. Um, a strength and conditioning professional and educator, Adam Virgil, has a whole series on on Excel for strength coaches. Really? And yeah, on YouTube. And I gotta uh, write this down, Adam. Virgil? Yeah, I'll send it to you if you have a show note. He's a he's a yeah. great person, um, and we've become friends now through it. I did. It's like a there's a whole bunch of dashboards. He just posted for free because he likes Excel and he sees a need for it. And I emailed him and I was like, "Thanks for doing that because like one, I'm immensely grateful." 
to anyone who shares their stuff and it goes a long way and then we talk shop and here we are but it's uh you know don't be afraid to learn and take risks because what's the worst that's going to happen if you have the opportunity i guess some people don't um yeah. i'm privileged that i do have those opportunities mm -hmm. when they present and then and then the, the last thing that i will find is like know who you are and don't be afraid to make a path for yourself i i think we're getting an age which is really weird and i don't want to talk too much about it but it's like this whole time period of COVID and quarantine is really interesting because it's for me, I'm sure it's for everyone, has been an identity shakeup in the sense of like, are gyms even going to exist? Which they will, but I'm like, wow, like they might not. Like it's changed the playing field for yeah. at least a while. Yeah. And I see these like at home apps or I see like, what's the new product? The mirror, I think it is. Yeah. Oh, I saw that the other day. Yeah. The full, right. like the Which full is, length mirror. Yeah. That's like a, right. a smartphone almost. That you... Right. And I'm like, wow, like, I don't want to say we're replaceable, but we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what that, so, so then I'm like, okay, well, where does this leave us? And it's like, it really comes down to one specific work and quality. So I'll give you an example. I'm an AT and a strength coach there's a need for a dual role, whether people realize it or not, make that role. I have a buddy who, um, you know, he likes surfing. His, his dream is to be a strength and conditioning for surfers. Like if you have unique interests and hobbies, don't be afraid to blend them and try to make your own pack because it will, will come, you know, just being a strength and conditioning coach, just being an athletic trainer. That's good. But that's, that's not, in my opinion, quality, that's not special and it's not fulfilling. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that goes a long way for people. Um, that's that's really, really good point. Um, you know, I know people that have worked in the circus as an athletic trainer. And I'm like, that's an unbelievably cool job. <laughs> yeah. Like, how did you do that? Or and I, I know people that were in the rodeo. Or I know people that were in the <laughs> X Games. And it's like, wow. So that kid with tattoo sleeves and gauges in his ears, as the teacher said, is unprofessional, now works for the X Games. Like, yeah. shocker. Shocker how that right. works out. <laughs> right. And when I took my PRI course, there was someone there that worked with Cirque du, uh, du Soleil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, like, yeah, there's so many different things out there. But that's a, that's a really cool point to kind of forge your path. And, um, you know, I talk about this with undergrads also, where uh, we have, you know, there's a not just, I'm not talking about sacred heart here. This is just in general, right, right. Most, most undergrads are looking for the checklist they have to fulfill yes. to get the job they think they want. And I try to get them out of that mindset. It's not about the checklist. I had a great talk uh, last week with, with Andrew Smith from UConn and mm -hmm. uh, you know, he stood out so much just because of the little things that he did when he, when he, he reached out, like you said, you should do and asked to come observe and he showed up with a binder of his own training philosophy at 19 years old right which and, is unbelievable and showed up early for our four o'clock class stayed until i was done coaching at nine and then we talked for about 45 minutes after and he didn't have to do that he wasn't right. even he wasn't even looking for a job and i know that because we tried to hire him at one point and he turned us down <laughs> right. <laughs> so, right so which he, is awesome right, right. he just so, like, he just did this for his own his own curiosity but when he like you know in this the point of that story is like we put a job posting out and we get a stack of applications and resumes that's 100 deep and they've all got the checklist filled they've all got the degree they've all right. got a certification like what do you do that's going to be you know stand out or make you unique for that specific role uh that's, that's yeah. a really good point no no and I, and I think and i think you have to not be afraid to not and i get it's obviously depending on if you can survive or not so there's a privilege that comes into it but you have to be not be afraid to turn things down if mm -hmm. there if it's not what you intuitively think will work um you know i i can't even tell you in my journey the unbelievable people that i've met in all aspects i'm like how did this how did you even get this and you create it yourself mm -hmm. and i see as a as a fitness and as a world we're heading to that point where it's like people might not want us as individuals but what would they want like really cool specific niche things mm, yeah um uh, so so don't be afraid to blend them uh, that, that's my overall message because it's like it, 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 I, it could exist yeah. yeah it's cool it's cool to think about i think about i live in dreamland a lot <laughs> um, in, in my spare time i like uh do a lot of guitar work and, and repairs and whatnot selfishly it's just a hobby i have i'm like that's awesome trying to figure out how to blend those no i'm kidding we, uh, so, my, uh, so my wife's a music teacher okay no and and we uh once once covid hit and we were both remote 
we're like, oh, we're going to like, we, you know, she bought me a guitar for my birthday a few years ago. We're like, oh, we're going to, we signed up for, um, what's it called? Uh, musician. It's like the self, yeah, 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 self-teaching yeah. app. I had used it for a while when she bought me the guitar and I thought it was a great app uh, just from a teaching standpoint. We're like, oh, we, we, we're going to be home. Like we can like pick up the skill. Mind you, we, we, we had our first, uh, our first baby in December. Oh, congratulations. So, thank you. That's so awesome. we had, but we had a three month old at home and we're like, <laughs> we never yeah. we never touched it we never yeah, touched the guitar <laughs> right right that's hilarious i didn't even ask you like your your family situation are are you married or uh no no i i i am single i have no no commitments at all like i am uh you know i don't want to say it's my career has driven these factors because i'm open to them but I, i'm definitely uh right now career and self-motivated first yeah. if that makes sense to you yeah it does um, it does which which again everything has trade-offs like mm-hmm. you know 100 you know i i don't pursue that being that like this is my number one priority or commitment but it's uh that could change i, I mean yeah. with the world right now i've i've like the only thing that's consistent is change <laughs> so yeah, I, hopefully was, I'm, uh seems like we got some good news this week with uh yeah, you know coming vaccine, out of germany yeah. but hopefully hopefully that comes through yeah, and we'll see get back to normal soon yeah yeah um, so, that, so that's like uh that's the biggest thing and, and don't be afraid to uh the only other thing i would say is like for, for people like don't be afraid to fail like those are teaching moments i mean yeah. I can't even tell you how many times I thought an exercise was going to be really cool and it was just so lame uh, <laughs> or didn't even work. And it's yeah. like, okay, well, that's a teaching moment or wasted my time uh, or what I thought was wasted time on a course or a talk and looking back and like, no, this actually, I had this the whole time, you know, so. Yeah, that's very cool. Well, Joe, I can't thank you enough for your yeah, time here. Yeah, my pleasure. We'll have to this do it again awesome. at some point. This I would was, love to, I would time. love to. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not going to put it on this because if this goes public, but, but if any of your students ever want to talk shop or reach out, uh, pass, pass my info along. I, I think you got to just, I love talking shop. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and if, and, if you're, you know, if, if, uh, if scheduling is, is flexible now, I know there's students that, that want to talk to you. I know, uh, Ethan Zindel is one. Okay. Uh, he's, okay. He, well, yeah. Talks about you all the time. He loved having you in, uh, in sports med. It must've been awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So, so, uh, yeah, I mean, feel free to pass my email or info to them. And uh, if anyone ever watches this, uh, I'm not going to post any social media tags because all unless you like the Grateful Dead and guitar, oh, um, you that's won't. Our, that's our our daughter's uh, favorite station that we play. Really? Oh, she'll like as soon as we say it, like she'll start dancing. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so, funny, so now, so, so now, I, so now I got now I got a, I got a funny story. I didn't want to bring it, but I'll <laughs> tell you. And it, it's this is truly blending of all the worlds. So I, I am a huge fan and musician myself. And I went I I and this also ties in social media. Um, I'll try to keep this as quick as possible. A good friend of mine now I saw on social media. I didn't know him at the time. He was hosting an exhibit of all the the artwork and whatnot in Brooklyn. So I I just took a train and went. This is 2019. He's a tattoo artist as well. I started talking with him and he's like, oh, you should come back tomorrow. You know, I'm giving a special tattoos for like $30. I'm like, oh, I have work. I don't live in the city. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, he's like, oh, dude, if you ever want one, let me know. And I'm like, yeah, you know, it'd be pretty cool to have a skeleton in like a, a posture that I wanted. This is like so <laughs> nerdy. So it's a left <laughs> AIC posture. No way. So- oh yeah. But, but I was like, I was like, you know, you get- I'm like, I'm not getting into the details. And he's like, no, 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 tell me more about this. And I'm like, you sure you really want to know about this? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm a tattoo artist. And for the past six months, I've been having right-sided issues. Oh, and I have no idea. And I'm just like, so intrigued. And then I thought like, well, that's a population I never thought I would work with. So we exchanged information and and I was able to help him a lot. Oh, that's um, so cool. <laughs> it was really cool. And we learned a lot and we just expressed stuff. But I was like, wow, that's like a shameless plug. For Wait, like... so, so did you get the tattoo and I the did. left eye? I, <laughs> I did. I did. I did. And, and, and I'm not going to show it or talk about it, but, but yes, it, it, I do have one. Um, but, but, but what was, what was cool is I was like, wow, this is a population that I never thought that I would work with as with my skill set, And like, clearly there is a need for this. And I was like, wow, you're in extremely concentrated, precise movement at all time. And uh, wow. And I, it, from what we talked about, it made it different. And he was like, yeah, you know, I'm constantly reaching with my right side to get 
yeah. ink and whatnot. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, this makes a lot of sense. So he switched his setup and he was able to have a lot of relief. And I was like, wow, That's a just, cool just by making that change? Or did you like, program yeah, and a couple other things. Of, yeah. I gave him a couple of exercises, nothing crazy, mm-hmm. and footwear suggestions, you know, to kind of just building an arch and it, it helped. And I was like, yeah, you know, that comes to like, that's a super niche market that like now, like for, for whoever, whatever student yeah. you're watching that, like, likes tattoos and strength and conditioning, like, I guess there's a need for it. So cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's really cool. So, so, you know, um, but yeah, longer the short of it is like I, on social media, I'm by no means I'm invested in strength and conditioning. Okay. Um, so I don't know if like, I mean, there are people who are constantly posting their training and theories yeah, yeah. and I'm like, eh, I'd rather just talk, but, um, but yeah, but anyone who ever wants to reach out, you know. All right. Yeah, I'll pass that along. I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure they will. And love, yeah, this love this it. was great. I can't wait to yeah, break it was a this blast. down. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I hope so. I, I, I had a blast. I, I really did. And I, I love giving back. And I'm glad I'm able to to the university because the university really did give a lot to me. And I am grateful for it. And I am one very jealous, but super impressed by by the new campus and uh the resources you have it's unbelievable yeah so, i feel very so, lucky i came in after it was already open so i didn't really see the change but uh yeah it's yeah. very nice yeah and who, whoever is there um now like appreciate it because i know it is state-of-the-art and i could honestly say that so very good, good all stuff. right Joe. well we'll tell Thanks everyone so hello uh i hope one day i could get down there sooner than not but i understand it's a tough time now but uh yeah yeah my pleasure yeah my of pleasure. course all right joe have a good one be well <laughs>